contacts, 54 countries, over 2,000 languages, but united with similar interests. As news breaks, we give you in-depth analysis around Africa every Monday on Core TV News. Feels so good to have you on the program around Africa this week, where we'll bring to you top issues rocking the continent. I'm your host, Brownson Uwana. On the program today, we'll be taking a trip back to South Sudan. We've been there before, but this time around, uh, it's for a good purpose. The two warring parties have finally come to an agreement to share power between both sides. I would see Rek Masha returning back to the country peacefully this time as uh, Prime Minister. And of course, Abakir will be maintaining his position as the President. But this time around, uh, they, 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 they'll be sharing um, powers and um, see how they can uh, conduct a peaceful election that will bring in another government. But the big question in the minds of most Africans and interested people as far as South Sudan is concerned is, is the deal going to hold? Is it going to go through? Are they going to respect the ceasefire deal? We'll be finding out on the program. Balazakai is joining me. Balazakai, good to have you on the program. Thank you. South Sudan, very, very interesting. Uh, 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 most people want, want to say that um, probably they were not right enough to have gotten their independence, uh, looking at um, the war that had been happening in that, um, in that part of the country, um, just 2011, and then um, within how many months, war, and of course, um, uh, it looking like it's already a failed state. But the peace deal that, uh, we, we've seen several peace deals that has come and gone, and the two parties have not really respected it. But do you think this might just be any different? You know, when, when, when you look at the continent of Africa generally, you know, uh, that flank of Africa where you have South Sudan is basically called the Horn of Africa, right? It's in places, that part of the flank that you have uh, countries like Djibouti, right? You, you have Eritrea, you have Ethiopia, then you have the Sudan. Now we have the, both Sudans, you know, Sudan of Khartoum and Sudan of Juba. You have uh, Uganda, you have Somalia, you have, and, and the rest. Generally, that flank of Africa has not, never been very, very stable. That is one thing everybody needs to understand. But as a, around the time, the Sudan of Juba became the 193rd country. A lot of us felt that was going to be the beginning of El Dorado for the continent of Africa. Because it will be very difficult for anybody to say, or it will be contestable for anybody to say that flank of Sudan, now called the Sudan of Juba, was not matured enough you know, for independence. Because it's been long since they started asking, you know, complaining, yearning, and fighting for self-governance ages ago. And around the time we had somebody like John Garan you know, who we can say was the father of South Sudan. You know, from his struggles to the time he became a vice president and how he even lost his life, a lot of us felt when the referendum finally came into being and they voted, you know, overwhelmingly, you know, to secede, a lot of us felt it was going to be good. But when South Sudan or Sudan of Juba became the 193rd country, in July 2011, it was celebration across the entire world, you know. But strange enough, you know, people that have fought for years or decades for self-governance, all of a sudden discover that with all the endowments, you know, the crude oil endowment, other mineral endowments, even the removal of sanctions, you know, with all this, we thought they were set to become the United Arab Emirate of Africa. But strange enough, you just had two gladiators, yeah, Silva Kier and Rick Marsha couldn't agree. You had just two major tribes, the Nuas and the Dimkas, they couldn't agree. You know, what they did was a disappointment to African Union, was a disappointment to the continent of Africa. But we hope this time around with some of the peace deals that have been brokered on the table, we hope we are going to see a united South Sudan. We hope we are going to see a, a, a South Sudan that will be devoid of some of the kind of hungry looking citizens that we see on the screen. Now, based on your analysis, would you at this point really agree that um, South Sudan really deserved the independence they got? They deserve the independence. Okay, when you talk about crusaders, 
Crusaders basically are people who will show you or present to you their level of maturity, depending on what they are looking for. In the case of Sudan, of Juba, I mean, it was very clear. They have demonstrated that, I mean, they didn't like what they were going through, right? Because first of all, they were black Africans compared to the Arab Africans, right? You had more of Christians and animists in the South, while you had the other ones that were what? More of Islamic, you know, and Arab. But at a point they felt if that they were divided into two countries across that line, you know, they were going to do well. But strange enough, it is now clear that sectarianism does not bring about peace. But were they ready? That, that, that's a they, lovely they, question. They were hundred percent ready. Remember, there was a referendum. Referendum is it's it's an opportunity for people to express their minds depending on what they're looking for. The referendum was on rights to secede or self-governance. And before that time, they had one of their major leaders, somebody in the person of late John Garan. He sacrificed his life, basically in the struggle. As at that time, they were 100% ready. But what some of us are beginning to have later found out was that, you see, being successful as guerrilla fighters, being successful as emancipators, you know, being successful as liberators does not necessarily mean you have what it takes to govern yourself politically. And that's why some of us have always advised and suggested that you could be people that moved for a country to get independence. But at the point of independence, political governance is completely different from guerrilla fighting. Political governance is completely different from the way you fought to get independence. At the point of independence, and when you're talking about self-governance, you need to bring in the right people. Because at that point, you are supposed to put a roadmap or a framework on how your country is going to be led generationally. And some of us are, have, based on our analysis, we've discovered that it was possible they were military gladiators, right? who fought for the independence, but as far as political maturity and experience was concerned, I think they needed more South Sudanese to help in charting the framework or planning the roadmap for self-governance and the future progress of South Sudan. Now, at this point now, can we say that um, the, the war and the, the, the crisis that has been rocking that country has to do with um, the sharing of power? Of course, it was is, is very, very clear because Silver Kier and Rayek Masha are, have been and are still major gladiators. I mean, so the only thing we can see is the level of their inability to run an inclusive or a democratically inclusive government. So what led to what we are seeing is basically greed rather than the national interest and progress of South Sudanese. Because a country that was looking so blessed that in, when you compare it to a country like Nigeria, I mean, South Sudan's population as a whole is less than the population of Lagos State alone in Nigeria. And with all the mineral endowments, with all the sanctions removed, with all the support that the United Nations was willing to give them, with all the, the, the support that, I mean, uh, African Union was supposed to give them, you know, and other NGOs, we expected them to have made inroads. And as I speak to you today, I can tell you, they have, there are great South Sudanese in diaspora, in engineering, in IT, in medical sciences, in journalism, in environmental sciences. Those were people that were willing to come and contribute to the progress of South Sudan. But probably the military gladiators fell because they succeeded. You know, then they had what it meant to politically and democratically lead. These are two different things. And that's why some of us always appreciate, you know, our heroes, especially in military warfare. But if it is possible, opportunities should be given to those who have the political and democratic experience to lead the country. 
Now, uh, for, for, for a lot of people who want to say that, some for this country to really enjoy the inclusive government that they have proposed to run um, sh the power sharing formula, they have to be trust between both sides. Now, don't forget that one of the reasons why this crisis started in South Sudan was because there was um, a story of a, a, an attempted coup that didn't go through. Now, looking at um, the whole thing, would you say um, there was really a coup to overtake um, Sabakir? Well, whether there was a coup or no coup is left to, to history and posterity to continue to analyze and judge. But as far as we were concerned, and are still concerned, Salva Kiir and Riek Masha are two great sons of South Sudan. If Salva Kiir falls dead today, Sudan, South Sudan has lost an illustrious son. If Riek Masha falls dead today, South Sudan has lost an illustrious son. So what we are expecting is for these two great sons, right, of South Sudan to synergize, right, and see how they can, first of all, remove that seed of distrust that was consciously or unconsciously, you know, developed or sown in between them. Is that, that possible? It, it's very possible. The only, it is possible as long as they put the national interest of South Sudan, I mean, at the front burner. It's very possible because they lack, they truly lack nothing today, right? The country has everything it requires. They have South Sudanese in diaspora, they have the mineral resources, and they have the intellect. All they need to do is to remove that bad seed of distrust, right? Be willing to in, uh, uh, plant in or building an inclusive government and plan to nationally bequeath a good generation for future South Sudanese. As long as they are willing, both of them, because they are major gladiators today and heroes, I mean, of, of that country, as long as they are willing to bequeath a good history and legacy, right, which will be positive to future South Sudanese, then they will remove primordial sentiments. They will want to remove tribal sentiments and make sure today they sit down and plan what we call an integrative bargain. An integrative bargain simply means a win-win bargain. And I'm telling you, South Sudan will be grateful to them. Because as we speak, they are the pioneers, democratic leaders of South Sudan. All right, let's see how well that goes. Uh, as, as, as much as a lot of people are waiting to see how well the peace deal between the two warring parties, the two gladiators, is concerned, there's another um, faction in support of Savakir that also asking for uh, the fact that apart from the um, prime minister position, there should be a vice president coming from Rick Marshall Camp. We'll be looking at that after this break. Stay with us. I and my party, the party I'm, I'm leading, and the army that I'm leading will implement this agreement without any fail. By me signing today this agreement, I'm sending the signal that this conflict must be ended peacefully. I hope the other side will also be serious. I'm the president of South Sudan, and I must always remain in that position as the president, the leader of that country. One continent, 54 countries, over 2,000 languages, but united in similar interests. As news breaks, we give you in-depth analysis around Africa every Monday on Core TV News. With us, you're still watching Around Africa on Core TV News. Before we went on the break, we've been looking at um, um, the issues that have resulted to where South Sudan is right now. And of course, uh, there's been a proposal for peace deal between both parties. And of course, uh, it's a sh power sharing formula that will see um, Riek Machel returning back to, as one of the leaders of South Sudan, this time on a peaceful note. And of course, there's another warring party that are saying that um, they want a, a vice president um, to emerge uh, apart from the, uh, the 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 prime minister and the presidential position this one now from uh, the camp of the president what's really about the vice president's position uh, should, should they look at that or they should uh, concentrate on the peace deal 
I think concentration on the peace deal is the best way to go. South Sudanese need to understand that as it stands today, the only thing that will take them out of the woods and put them on the international pedestal positively is for them to have a transparent, right, a trusted, and a government that is devoid of cynicism. As South Sudan stands today, they should remove personal or primordial sentiments. Tribal sentiments should be out of it. They should be willing to look for people who are South Sudanese of proving credentials in terms of credibility and integrity. They should be willing to run an inclusive government. Once they do that, then their country will be respected. But if they continue to have mutual distrust among them, first of all, the country is not going to make for, move forward. And these two gladiators, that is Rig Masha and Salvaikia, will, all, will never be remembered by the positive history of the future. Everything about them will one day be consigned to the dustbin of history. As far as people like me are concerned, as an international affairs uh, analyst, we will appreciate it if Salva Kiir, Rig Masha, and their respective lieutenants will bequeath a positive history, right, and legacy for the young South Sudanese to come. Now, the big problem also is the fact that um, uh, for every country, we expect to see at least a vice president. And uh, if you okay, now let, let me please devil's advocate by saying, I don't think it's just um, a, a little reasonable to say, let's have a vice president and then let's also have a prime minister. There is nothing wrong in having respective offices as long as it is done in national interest. Some of us are saying this thing because people like me were among those who carry out the projection after detailed analysis, as far back as August 2011, and, and, and 11, when South Sudan just graduated into the newest country and the 193rd country in the world. We appreciated it, we projected, we saw the human development index of South Sudan rising. We saw how the assets, which are natural endowments and human also capital of South Sudan will be harnessed for the progress of that country. We also noticed how the United Nations was willing to support South Sudan. NGOs were willing to flood into South Sudan. AU was willing to support South Sudan to stand on its feet. So South Sudan needs to understand that after Rick Marsha, right, and Salva Kiir, there will still be South Sudan. If a great father like John Garan, who fought for that country, you know, could willingly or one day live and bequeathed a history or a legacy of struggle for self-governance, now that they've had the self-governance, I think we will expect that in national interest, right, they should understand that a win-win situation is what all of us wish for them. All right. Now, um, I, I think most times uh, we, we are always very quick to blame um, you know, I said, um, the African Union. But uh, let's look at, let's leave African Union this time and look at the international community, especially the United Nations. Now, um, most people also want to argue that the um, United Nations have not really done well or some of the inter international community to really give South Sudan the real um, or a, a better support of being a nation. We don't want to agree with that. The United Nations gave all the support it needed to give South Sudan. Remember that when you talk about United Nations, you're talking about just a conglomeration of respective countries or nations who also have their own internal problems. But at a point, they all congregated with one voice and supported the independence of South Sudan. And before that time, they also gave credibility or lent their credibility to even the referendum. What else does South Sudan need? What else does South Sudan need? What would you say has been their role in the whole crisis? Well, they've also been mediating, right? We, we, we've seen it. We've seen the effort they've been making in terms of supplies for food, in terms of doing something about health care and, uh, and, uh, and maybe food, shelter, and the rest for the traumatized civilians. We've seen it, and the children. 
They've always been saying, they've also been coming out to voice their frustration because the two gladiators were not willing to come to a round table. But as we stand today, we are all, I mean, in support that let the peace deal continue. No matter how fragile it is, let the peace deal continue. The reason is because we hope that along the line, South Sudanese in diaspora will also come in to support. But before they come in, we are appealing to these two major camps, please to allow peace reign, to also be willing to run an inclusive government. And the only way they can do that is by everybody accepting that Salva Kiir's camp is here, Rick Machard here camp is here. None of them is 100% correct. The truth is neither with Salva Kiir or with Rick Machard. The truth is in the center. And that center also is within South Sudan. So it simply means Salva Kiir will come in, Rick Masha will come in with their respective lieutenants in national interest and make sure they take advantage of that truth and positive generational growth for South Sudan. Now, inclusive governments have been agreed, and of course, that it's going to run. But with, with, uh, with the whole faction thing still involved, do you think the peace deal will, will, will probably last? If there is cynicism, if there is still factionalization, then an inclusive government has not been agreed. What will make the government to be inclusive and acceptable is when they put national interest. So in addition to wanting to have an inclusive government, let national interest of South Sudan, the future of South Sudan, and a positive legacy for the generation of yesterday years coming generation of South Sudan be the key interest. Now, well, one of the important things about um, the whole peace deal is for us to see a transitional government that will see a neutral person come to power. Now, do you think it's very possible? Now, Riek Masha feels he has fought so much for this country, and of course, he was part of the process that gave them the independence, and Savakir on his little part felt like he was the, the front runner of the independence. Do you think it's very possible for us to see where this two gladiators will sit down and become ordinary citizens while they watch someone else become the president of the country. There is nothing wrong in major gladiators who move for an independence of a country to one day bless new leaders so that their country will move forward. That is what you call selfless service. Because you could be the people that started it. You could be the crusaders. But at some point, when it comes to political governance, it's good to give peace a chance. We saw it in the case of uh, Angola. We saw what happened in the days of Jonah Savimbi. Every time some of us remember Jonah Savimbi, we feel sad. Jonah Savimbi was one of the major people you know, that fought for the independence of that country, self-governance. But at a point, he couldn't allow the sitting president to have peace. And the way and manner he died or he left the political scene was sad. Even at that, he was given a national what? A national burial and honor. That simply demonstrates to you that you can be those who initiated moves, you know? And, 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 and the crusades for independence. But when it comes to political governance, it could be a different game. But in national interest, let the citizens of that country that have the necessary integrity and credibility lead. All right, finally, before I let you go, um, do you see this peace deal uh, really working out? We hope the peace deal will work out. The only thing that needs to work out is the peace deal. As it stands today, I mean, South Sudan has lost so much. Between July 2011 and this late 2014, you're talking about probably almost three years of things not stabilizing, of a fragile government. They are yet to actually fully plan the seed of what? Educational development, the seed of industrial growth, the seed of health growth. And it's, it's very clear, time is not going to wait for South Sudan. It is in the interest of South Sudanese 
to plan and arrange an integrative bargain for these two warring factions so that one day they will bequeath a positive history. I wouldn't want to see Rick Masha and O Salvaikia consigned to the dustbin of history. I would want them to be remembered and appreciated like their former leader, John Garan. Thank you very much for for that uh, incisive analysis. Thank you. Uh, as far as South Sudan is concerned. And of course, it is hoped and expected that um, the two warring parties will really come together and, of course, to do the needful of what the international community and, of course, um, all South Sudanese want at this time. And that's peace and, of course, ability for every South Sudanese to be able to sleep in their homes without um, having to keep their one eye open. Thank you very much for being a part of Around Africa this week. My name is Brown Sinuad, and, of course, the program will be back again next week. Do join us then. Have a wonderful day. One continent, 54 countries, over 2,000 languages, but united with similar interests. As news breaks, we give you in-depth analysis around Africa every Monday on Core TV News.